Every decade or so, a new technology arrives that transforms our world. Hundreds of centuries ago, if I borrowed you money, for example, and you didn't return it to me, then it would ruin your reputation and nobody would want to do business with you. Now, as our networks broaden and trade has become much more complex, institutions were formed to facilitate transactions between us. Institutions like banks, like governments, these institutions helped us store our capital, helped us exchange value between one another, insured our assets. Now when the internet developed, it created a new set of, of marketplaces, digital marketplaces like Uber, like Facebook, like Airbnb, like eToro. With the help of reviews and brand awareness and check marks and likes, we were able to trust these networks and broaden our network and in our interactions with one another. And today, this is what helps us put our credit card online or allow strangers to rent our house or copy anonymous traders or date someone we just swiped our finger on. But the problem with these institutions and these networks is, first of all, they can get hacked. And we've seen it with Target, with Walmart. Second of all, they can be extremely slow. Third of all, not everyone can access it. There are two billion people in the world that don't have a bank account. Fourth, they can fail. They can fail and compromise all of our assets. Five, they take a large chunk of the value, sometimes 10, 20, 30 percent. Six, they use our data. In fact, they own our data in a way that doesn't allow us to access it. In fact, sometimes they even sell our data, and this undermines our privacy. But what if we were able to transact and interact with each other without any institution in the middle that we needed to trust? In 2009, after the financial crisis, an anonymous person named Satoshi Nakamoto created a protocol for digital cash this protocol isn't owned by anyone and allows uh, people to transact with each other peer-to-peer -peer in a way that's streamlined, transparent, and immutable. This digital cash is called Bitcoin, and the technology that underlies it is the blockchain. The blockchain has incredible uh, potential, and the magic really lies in smart contracts. The best way to think about smart contracts is, is actually uh, someone gave me a way to think about it where the blockchain is the Excel and the ledger and basically the smart contracts are the macros. And I thought this was genius because I'm just an Excel geek. But indeed this is actually really a great way to explain it. Smart contracts are basically a piece of code that is attached to a blockchain which basically sets the term of a contract, verifies it, and executes it. For example, a smart contract can be upon receipt of funds, ship the product to X. The potential for this kind of technology is enormous. Today, when I want to transfer a fund overseas, it literally takes me more time to get those funds transferred versus me actually traveling to the city in which I need to deliver the cash and giving the cash in person. And the reason for that is because when we transfer today money through our bank, these funds go through several other institutions which do risk management and reconciliation because each of them hold different ledgers and settlement time is usually about three days. Another example where blockchain can improve our lives is shared economies like Uber, Airbnb, and Facebook. Despite their name of being shared economies, they don't really share much of the value with us at all despite us being the major contributors to these networks. Another example is remittances. Today, there are hundreds of millions of immigrant workers around the world. This is a $500 billion market. And each week, they need to go to a Western Union and send money to their families. And they're usually taking around 10% fees, and they don't know when the money is going to arrive on the other end. 
Another example of how blockchain is going to change our world is the Internet of Things. In several years from now, we're going to be operating within a chip economy, meaning that all our devices are going to have chips and they're going to transact on our behalf. Our refrigerator is going to be able to order food for us. Our laundry will order detergent. Our self-driving cars will sell fuel on their own. When we go into a store and we see something we like, we're just going to be able to take it and, and leave the store without us even having to take our credit card out or enter a point of sale. The only way to facilitate such an ecosystem is if we know that there is efficient and transparent way in which devices can transact on our behalf. And all of this is going to be facilitated by the blockchain. But what does it mean for us? What does it mean for investors and entrepreneurs? How can we benefit from the blockchain? In internet, traditional protocols like TCP IP, SSL, etc. These protocols weren't monetized directly, but rather it was the applications that were built on top of these protocols. Applications like Facebook and Google, that they were in fact monetized. Take for example Facebook. Facebook basically uses uh, the content we create and our engagement uh, to monetize. But you can imagine how a Facebook that's owned by, by a full network of people which basically compensates the content creators and the distributors and the people that are engaged can change the business model. And in fact, if this does happen and we see the evolution of business model-based networks, then this can be an Achilles heel of such networks. In fact, iAngels invested in one of these networks, KIN, which was created by KIC, which is the seventh largest messaging, uh, messaging app, which is doing exactly that. Now on blockchain, most of the value is actually created within the protocol layer. For example, if you take Bitcoin today, which has a valuation of 250 billion, and all the combined applications on top of Bitcoin don't even amount to more than $10 billion. Same thing with Ethereum. Ethereum today is worth $70 billion, and yet there hasn't been even one killer application that actually influences our life. And the reason for that, again, is the FAT protocol. So why does this happen in blockchain? There are actually two reasons. The first reason is the shared data layer. Basically, all the code is open source, so everyone owns the data and has this information. And what this does is it lowers the barriers to entry. But what makes the protocol layer better? This is where the access token comes in. The access token is the token that is basically used to use the application. So for example, in Bitcoin, it's transaction. In Ethereum, it's computing power. In Filecoin, it's for file storage. Now this access token has a speculative value because people who purchase the token early on will benefit from the upside if the network grows. And so what happens uh, in the case of blockchain, the early adopters who, uh, who buy the tokens and participate in the protocol, as the protocol grows and value is created, some of these people, entrepreneurs or investors, will create applications on top of the protocol. Sometimes they'll finance the development of this, these applications with their early profits. Adoption of the applications that they create will create more value again in the protocol layer. And as people and speculators and potential VCs and entrepreneurs see the growing adoption of such protocols, they will also enter in and start developing on top of the protocol thereby increasing the ecosystem and growing the value of the protocol layer. And this brings me to the next topic of ICOs. ICOs is basically uh, an initial coin offering. And it's when entrepreneurs decide to sell tokens of their networks in order to, in order to build networks. So what is an ICO? An ICO is basically a combination of finance, IPOs, equity crowdfunding, viral marketing, and technology. 
Today, entrepreneurs are using ICOs in order to, in order to fund their, their projects on the blockchain. So what is the investment process of an ICO? So the way we look at ICOs is actually very similar to how we analyze startups. We start out by looking at the team. Are these people that have experience? Do they have the grit and the ability to execute? Afterwards, we look at the idea. Is this idea big enough? Is this idea appropriate for the blockchain? Does it need a specific token? Or rather, can it use the Ethereum or Bitcoin tokens? All these questions are important because if it's not appropriate for the blockchain and doesn't need its own token, then the technology can be forked and another token will be implemented on top. Remember, these are open source projects. Then we look at the terms very similar to how we look at a startup. We look at how much the company is raising. We're looking at what are the token metrics. And lastly, we look at the traction, how well the company is doing so far, where they are in terms of the product, what is the roadmap, and how much community excitement have they generated already. By the time you go through this process, which takes usually around 15 minutes, you eliminate about 95% of the opportunities. ICOs have been incredibly hard to ignore. In Q2, ICO funding has actually overcome VC funding in blockchain. Are we in a bubble? All of us have been watching how the market soared and kind of swept through the 500 billion valuation while the technology hasn't caught up that fast. I mean, at the end of the day, blockchain still doesn't have any influence on our real day-to-day -day lives. However, exuberance and bubbles, they're all part of technology cycles. And in fact, they're necessary for technology cycles. But there's no doubt that when entrepreneurs that can't raise $5 million from a VC go and raise $30 million in an ICO, then eventually something's going to give. That said, back in 2013, Bitcoin price rose from 100 to 1,200 just in a couple of months. And it was incredibly volatile and scary. And indeed, it was a bubble. And after a couple of years, the price went back down to $200. That said, it's hard to argue today that the people that believed in Bitcoin and believed in the blockchain, and despite the decrease here, held Bitcoin, have enjoyed massive capital gains. In 2000, when the dot-com bubble burst, it reached $2.7 trillion of value. And this was more than two decades ago. It was mostly in the US. And don't forget, this is equity value, meaning that this value was a derivative of the expected profits of these companies. Whereas in blockchain networks, we're looking at total network value. So there is a lot of volatility ahead, but it looks like there is also an incredible amount of potential. We're still at the very early stages of adoption. Today, there are less than 30 million Bitcoin and Ethereum wallets. This was very surprising to me, actually, because with all the news and everybody talking about it and all the ICOs, it's quite amazing that still such a small amount of people are really in this market, while there are billions of people that can benefit from it in the long term. And as uh, products evolve and the UX improves and it becomes more possible for people to use and institutional investors will come in, we believe that the value will rise. And indeed, most of the value creation is still ahead of us. So should we invest in crypto assets? Unfortunately, I can't recommend that to anyone. You all need to kind of think about it and make your own decisions. But I can tell you that crypto assets are not correlated to traditional assets. Uh, they've been experiencing higher absolute returns, higher risk-adjusted returns, and even insignificant correlation among each other. So actually, they provide uh, a very good hedge to an otherwise well-constructed and well-balanced portfolio. Now, we all know this year that returns have been amazing. 
But the more important thing, of course, is risk-adjusted returns. And even here, if we look at the last six years, Bitcoin has outperformed every other asset indicated by sharp ratios. Sharp ratio is basically total return minus risk-free rate divided by the volatility. Blockchain is here to stay. We should learn from the lessons of the dot-com bubble. And we should be very careful with the investments we make. But we should remember that even after significant volatility and market corrections, we can see how the leaders of that period have emerged and created monopoli monopolization of their industries, companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon. And despite us being very early in the process, the adoption and the capital gains of Bitcoin and Ethereum should signal to us that we're in a real paradigm shift. With that, I would like to invite you to sign up on iangels.co if you'd like to learn more. We publish a lot of research and opportunities, and we hope to stay in touch with you. Thank you.